Okay, so I honestly used to love Schoolhouse Rock when I was a kid. Like they somehow managed to make songs about the preamble catchy and easy to understand. Do you guys know that song? Like I'm just a bill. It's like, I'm just a bill and I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Do you guys remember that? Like that lives rent free in my pyramid shaped head. The happy little cartoons, simple illustrations and playful melodies. It's no wonder that parents and educators turn to them to explain politics and the way our government works. After all, finding educational content for kids that addresses political events in an easy to digest way can be super difficult. And especially considering that for the most part, politics aren't really that simple and straightforward. And there's so much conflicting information out there. If you look up what is abortion or what is pro-choice for kids, you might find this short four minute video from Amaze. This video features a giant purple blob, kind of like the McDonald's mascot Grimace, but with far too many teeth, who explains what an abortion is, what different options are there for pregnant people and how different states have different rules. It's friendly and assuring, but the episode is from 2020. So the information around legal rights is now outdated. Another result shows the reactions of kids being asked if they would ever hurt or kill their future child with the human coalition seemingly defining this as abortion. There is no nuance, no gray area. This video, in my opinion, is purely made to tug on heartstrings and create guilt. So yeah, there are two very different messages here, even though they were back to back in the search results when I looked up, what is abortion? This is where PragerU Kids steps in. So with that being said, hello and welcome to the corporate casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're talking about PragerU's programming for children. Now, PragerU Kids claims to, quote, promote American values through the creative use of educational videos that reach millions of people online. Serving all ages, our content offers a free alternative to the dominant left-wing ideology in culture, media, and education. Whether you're searching for a deeper understanding, a new perspective, or a way to get involved, PragerU helps people think and live better. So as long as PragerU Kids is actually educating and speaking honestly, then I'd have no problem with them. However, this alternative that they present isn't necessarily, well, how do I say this, accurate. Regardless of political affiliation, there is no alternative to factual information. Instead, PragerU Kids seems to rewrite history in order to push specific narratives onto kids. They take that unbiased, wholesome, and straightforward approach that Schoolhouse Rock established and turned it into something completely upside down, inside out, and backwards. You know, the usual MO for Prager, but for kids and without the catchy music. One of their most popular programs is called Leo and Layla, which features a brother and sister that go back in time to talk to historians about present day issues. In theory, it sounds simple and pleasant enough. If they're learning about science, they talk to a scientist. If they're learning about the country's history, maybe talk to a former president. In one particular episode, Layla is writing an essay about the American dream and wondering if it still exists. She uses her phone, her time machine to travel back in time and talk to Benjamin Franklin. And it's one hell of a ride, that's for sure. Benjamin Franklin tells them that America is the land of opportunity where an individual can determine the outcome of their lives as opposed to their birth titles, like a nobleman or a duchess being the deciding factor. He tells Layla that since no one in America is born a Lord, Duke, Duchess, or King, that's proof that the American dream is alive and well. But Layla presents Franklin with a great question. Some people are born into better situations than others. Does that affect the American dream? Franklin answers her by saying that we all have equal opportunities, even though we may have unequal results. Even when treated equally, we don't end up in the same place, Franklin tells Layla. And that's real rich coming from a slave owner, but okay. But here's where I disagree with this message. We may not all be lords or dukes or kings or duchesses or whatever the hell, but the incredibly wealthy among us might as well be. They're just running around titleless. When Franklin explains what monarchs are to Layla, he condemns them for putting up systems that keep them in power while oppressing or harming others. And that's exactly what those who are way better off do today. And I'm not really talking about the 1%, I'm talking about like the 0.1%. Amazon has killed or undermined privacy protections in over three dozen bills across 25 states, according to Reuters. They smother privacy protection, potentially harming others so that their business can continue uninterrupted. Some of the wealthiest people out there, Elon Musk, for example, pay minuscule amounts of taxes. In 2007, Jeff Bezos didn't pay a single penny and Elon Musk paid almost no federal income taxes in 2018. So how is that equal in any sense of the word? Just saying, oh, well, anyone can start their own business and be successful doesn't excuse the massive difference in how the wealthiest middle-class and poorest classes of all the US are treated. 
And to try and play devil's advocate for just a moment, perhaps someone from PragerU would say that we're equal in the most important of ways. We all only get one vote. We all have the same right to pursue happiness, things like that. But even if that's true, lobbying undermines equality in voting and the will of the people isn't always made into law. The majority of Americans didn't want Roe v. Wade overturned, but it was. Corporate lobbying has allowed companies to kill labor reform acts. Many companies use these methods to lower their taxes, like when FedEx spent about $10 million in corporate lobbying only to save $1.6 billion in taxes the following year. This isn't to say that lobbying can't ever be used as a powerful and beneficial tool, but for PragerU to teach kids that we're all equal and always have been is ignoring the evidence that speaks to the contrary. And this doesn't even begin to cover the fact that millions of Americans can't vote in the first place. Whether they're a felon, unable to get an ID, or even just being able to afford to get away from work for a day and don't wanna risk losing their job. It's not as easy as everyone has a voice, but that's what PragerU has boiled it down to. We're all equal, therefore the American dream is just dandy. And there's kind of this underlying tone of implying that anyone who tells you otherwise is un-American, which feels extremely hypocritical and strange when on one hand, they act like America is a great force fighting for equality, but on the other, if you point out any inequality, then you're just unpatriotic. But all right, that's just one episode made for kids, right? Maybe I'm reading way too much into things. So let's take a look at a different episode of Leo and Layla. Another episode opens with Leo and Layla watching the news, flipping through channels that say protesters want to abolish the police and watching footage of said protesters setting a car on fire. They ask, why is everyone so angry? But instead of answering the question, the pair goes back in time to meet an abolitionist, Frederick Douglass. Douglass tells the children that he wants to abolish slavery and that he himself is a former slave. When the kids ask him about the founding father's intentions around slavery, he also says, quote, "'Our founding fathers knew that slavery was evil and wrong, and they knew it would do terrible harm to the nation. They wanted it to end, but their first priority was getting all 13 colonies to unite as one country. The Southern colonies were dependent on slave labor and they wouldn't join a union that had banned it. So in order for the Southern colonies to not create a slave owning country at the end of the Revolutionary War, they made it acceptable. The system the founding fathers created was meant to end slavery gradually. And according to the cartoon Douglas, slavery is a complicated problem that takes time to solve. This is why he condemns an abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison, who demands immediate change. And if he doesn't get what he wants, he sets things on fire. His approach is radical because he's trying to condemn this powerful American system that just takes time to work. Hence why Douglas is working from within the system itself to create a peaceful change. Now, let's start to pick apart why this narrative is actually harmful and inaccurate. First of all, saying that Douglas was completely against violence and unlawful behavior isn't actually fully accurate. He condemned the violence used by slave owners throughout his life, absolutely. But his very first act of breaking free from those that owned him was considered unlawful. His own personal journey demonstrated that violence as a response to slavery was necessary for actual change. In 1847, he declared that he had no patriotism and quote, I cannot have any love for this country or for its constitution. I desire to see it overthrown as speedily as possible. According to The Atlantic, he justified violence when abolitionists killed a deputy US marshal in their attempt to liberate a fugitive slave. It also claims that at times he seemed to act vain or opportunistic, conflating his own well being with what was best for black people as a whole. The point is to say that Frederick Douglass was an extremely complicated man, but saying that he was all about peacefully working from within and implying that he would be disappointed in the protesters of today is quite literally putting words in his mouth that just are not true. Now, the second point here is that all of this completely fails to mention the Civil War. You know, those extremely bloody battles that were by no stretch of the imagination, just peaceful change from within. Douglas was a consultant to President Lincoln during this time and helped to convince him that slaves would be able to serve in the Union forces. Again, acting as if Douglas didn't believe in violence for any reason goes against the steps that he took in life to abolish slavery. This could be because Leo and Layla traveled to 1852 and the Civil War didn't take place for almost a decade later. But it's still hilariously awful to me that they act as if peaceful compromise will change things. And spoiler alert, it won't. And they have cartoon Douglas say, our system is wonderful, even before the Civil War took place. And all it takes is opening up a history book to see that is quite literally, that is the opposite of what he actually said and believed in. Not only does this episode fail to address any necessary violence Douglas may have believed in, but it completely ignores any of the reasons why protesters are, you know, protesting. It paints the picture that today's protesters just don't understand how change happens over time and that they're violent and reckless. 
Thirdly, I find it extremely hypocritical that this episode looks at protests that want to abolish or defund the police, but it fails to look at other protests or even insurrections that may take place from other political views. These are just the overarching issues I have with this episode of Leo and Layla. It doesn't even begin to touch on the sprinkling of factual inaccuracies. Like when they say that the US was the first to begin the conversation on ending slavery, that's patently false. Britain passed the Slavery Abolition Act in 1834, Mexico abolished slavery in 1829, and a successful slave rebellion took place in colonial Haiti from 1791 to 1804. And as a fun little side note, I recently did a stream on Texas throwing a temper tantrum about why they wanna leave the US again. And if you take a look at the history of Texas itself, which seems to be a bit overlooked at times, you'll actually find that Texas seceded from two different countries to protect their right to continue owning slaves, both from the US and from Mexico. So just make sure that you remember that because history tends to erase those types of little details. Now, to continue onward, the US didn't actually formally abolish slavery until 1865, and it wasn't enacted in some places until 1866. So this is far from the first to start this conversation. Spain, Sweden, Denmark, and many more were ahead of the US by decades. Hell, Mississippi didn't even ratify the 13th Amendment until 2013. Yet the little blurb or description box under this Leo and Layla episode says it's an honest and accurate look at slavery. Could they not even be bothered to fact check this information? I mean, it's really not hard to see who banned slavery first and research Douglas's actual beliefs, but I guess that's too difficult for PragerU. Now, this seems to be a trend in the Lilo and Layla program. They insert words into a cartoon character's mouth using their reputation and credibility to make themselves look good and seem to have little care or concern for how accurate those words actually are. In another episode, they meet Adam Smith to learn about economics and capitalism. Smith tells them that before capitalism, people believed the amount of wealth in the world was limited, making some people very rich and others very poor. With capitalism, if you work hard, honestly, and fair, the amount you can have is limitless. They imply that capitalism is alive and well in the US, doing its job. Yet wealth inequality is drastically increasing here. The gap between the ultra rich and ultra poor has gotten larger to the point where more and more people are just surviving and barely at that. Yes, honest businesses can still succeed, but to act as if honest businesses will always prosper? Well, our history of corporate casket episodes argues otherwise. And that's just one example of the many out there. Once again, their message feels disingenuous when it is ignored many real and drastic problems that we have with capitalism today. They also meet with Teddy Roosevelt, who told Leo and Layla that even if it cost him the presidential primary, he wouldn't make a decision solely because it was popular. I find it especially interesting that he tells the children his biggest regret is not running for a third term, as there were murmurings that he was too powerful. Against my better judgment, I listened to them, Roosevelt tells the kids. You worried about what other people thought and it came back to bite you, Leo agreed. And yeah, I love how this little dead-eyed blue-haired kid agrees that Roosevelt should have run for a third term just because he wanted to. Now, because Teddy's first term was only three years long as he got it from the former president when he was assassinated and he was vice president at the time, he did actually qualify for another term. Yet the timing of this episode posted in April of 2022, which states that going against the crowd and running for a longer amount of time is a good idea, isn't lost on me. On the other hand, when they talk to George Washington, he tells the kids that no one American should have too much power and he doesn't want to be perceived as a king by the American people. It would be hypocritical of him to run again and cling to power after escaping British rule. It feels like there are conflicting messages in the show, frankly. During another episode, when they learn about Paul Revere, they talk to Henry Longfellow, the poet who wrote The Midnight Ride. Longfellow exaggerated parts of Revere's ride in his poem, leading to many myths about Revere being perpetuated to this very day. But Leo and Layla don't really address that. They treat Longfellow as the absolute authority on Revere instead of, you know, just talking to Revere himself. Because of course, like when we're talking to people that are long gone and dead, why not talk to the actual source in this made up game? They even travel back over 3000 years in time to talk to a biblical figure, Ruth, and learn what it means to be loyal to family. Gotta love the mix of politics and religion in the series, right? Well, Ruth tells them that taking care of family is never a burden, which it absolutely can be, and what it meant to stick by her mother-in-law's side after her husband passed away. The fact of the matter is that this series is essentially just a way to put words in historical or even biblical figures' mouths. While they might use quotations from time to time, the kids are presenting these people with modern controversies. Now, that's not to say that George Washington couldn't possibly understand today's issues, but it's not as if he ever could be aware of them. Why use figures that are decades, if not centuries old, to explain the problems we face in 2022? Why not ask people that are currently dealing with these problems today? 
And again, there are way more factual inaccuracies between these episodes, but I can't possibly address all of them. It just strikes me as odd the way that they twist the words of Frederick Douglass, George Washington, and plenty more. Unfortunately, this isn't their only program. And before we continue to talk about other issues that are held within PragerU Kids, let's just take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor. When you run a business, time seems ever more precious. Every misplaced moment feels like a missed opportunity, a lost chance to make your business better, or even just to step away and recharge. Well, ShipStation is here to give e-commerce sellers like you more time to do what they really love. Unless what you really love to do is managing every single little detail of order fulfillment, which trust me, I don't really enjoy it. Well, ShipStation's here to help. ShipStation automates time-sensitive shipping processes so you can get back to focusing on bigger things like developing new products, honing in your market strategy, or interacting with customers. It's no wonder ShipStation is already trusted by over 100,000 sellers. ShipStation helps make things easier so you can compare every single seller to every single location you're shipping to and gives you the best rate they can find. And for me, when I'm saving time not having to negotiate through different websites to find best shipping options, it gives me more time to work on new candle fragrances, new scents, new whatevers, but it all has to do with the business. And it's gonna work with any storefront you work with. So it doesn't matter if you're selling on Amazon, eBay, Etsy, or more. It lets you automate all the manual work that goes into taking care of shipping. And in fact, 98% of companies that use ShipStation for a year keep using it as long as they're in business. So it's time to let go of all those shipping tasks. ShipStation can do it better and faster. Sign up using promo code CASKET for a free 60-day trial today at ShipStation.com and start saving time with every shipment. That's two whole months of shipping made quick and painless, and it's free to try. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in CASKET. ShipStation, make ship happen. And this episode's also sponsored by me because I kind of wanted it to be. I just wanted to let you know, in case you didn't, that I do in fact have a candle shop that's not a hypothetical. It's called Knox Investa, KnoxVesta.com, N-O-X-V-E-S-T-A.com. We sell high-end, super sustainable luxury candles. If you're interested in taking a look, feel free to. We're actually getting ready to do a big restock, including we're gonna be bringing back finally our six ounce mini candles that many of you have been waiting for. So if you haven't already checked it out, make sure to check it out, knoxvesta.com, and make sure to add yourself to the email list so that you'll be the first one notified when those six ounces come back in stock, knoxvesta.com. Woo woo! Now back to the episode. Now PragerU also has a program called TBH History, which is relatively basic and inoffensive. The acting is a choice and it's a little bit all over the place, but it tends to not be as controversial or political as the Leo and Layla show. And sure, maybe it's a bit simplified, but the show is for kids, so I can't entirely fault them for that. Now, aside from the history programs, they've also got a story time show called Otto's Tales. In one of them, Paloma wants to be Lady Freedom, the narrator tells a story of a young girl, Paloma, that learns all about the Capitol building. She learns to be brave like Lady Freedom and that Americans are born free, except the ones that aren't, I guess. Another book, The Little Red Hen, talks about how important it is to be a self-starter and to do hard work. For the record, kids, if anyone in a job interview asks if you're a self-starter, run the fuck away and do it quickly. When none of the hen's friends help her gather wheat, make flour, and eventually make bread, none of them get to eat the bread with her. The narrator says, And in America, we believe that everyone can do good, hard work to earn what they want and need in life. There are also books about the national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance and classics like The Emperor's New Clothes. While their shows are a bit of a toss up as to how downright offensive or factually inaccurate they might be, the problem with PragerU Kids, in my opinion, is the atmosphere. It feels like propaganda, even if it's not as blatant as I've seen like with North Korea or Russian propaganda. While being biased happens, these shows are so biased that facts seem to take second place to patriotism. And seriously, saying that the US was the first to start the conversation around ending slavery or consistently treating our system as better than the rest, flawless and being able to be worked through peacefully is completely ignoring our bloody history. It doesn't address the many issues that we do have within our system. And I'm sure that many people would find it downright insulting to hear Cartoon Douglas say that our system is great in 1852. I know this honestly shouldn't be any surprise considering where PragerU itself comes from. Prager University, despite not being a university whatsoever, acts as if it's an educational tool. It's been around since 2009, creating brief five minute YouTube videos chock full of factual inaccuracies, a favorite term for today's episode. Their alternative voice in the measured tone of an online university sure seems educational to those that watch, leading their show to become an indispensable propaganda device. I've already spoken about that side of things, the conservative radio talk show host, Dennis Prager, who started it. So I'm not gonna dwell too long on their history. There is an entire episode dedicated to it already. 
needless to say, it is no surprise that PragerU Kids is also rubbing me the wrong way. But at least I'm not alone in my skepticism. A couple of years ago, a 10th grade history teacher in Maumee County, Ohio, made national news after telling students they'd receive extra credit if they watched PragerU videos, which Yahoo News calls right-wing propaganda. It seems that PragerU kids thought this was a fantastic idea, and despite the outrage around the time, they launched PrEP, their PragerU kids programs meant for kids and educators alike. A writer for Daily Kost said that ever since then, the PragerU kids shows have been heavily advertised to kids, appearing in front of Mr. Beast videos and the like. The article writer's 11-year-old allegedly said, quote, they sound reasonable and educated at first, but then you see they're just giving conservative talking points about racism and anti-wokeness. At least it's pretty obvious that they're doing so, so hopefully parents, educators, and kids will be able to see right through them. But then again, with their videos, whether for kids or adults being constantly recommended, it seems like they're getting harder and harder to avoid. And you're probably not gonna be surprised to find that if you're watching this on YouTube and you do have ads appearing on this episode, you're probably going to find that PragerU is advertising in almost every single one of those slots. So they like to say that they're being suppressed, but I bet you, even though this is a video that is critiquing them, they're gonna be all over this in the ads. And I apologize for that. I can't really stop it. It's a YouTube thing. In fact, let's maybe see if I'm right. A PragerU ad will perhaps appear right here. Was I right? I don't know, let me know. Now, in one 2018 report from sociologist Francesca Tripodi, it reads, content creators like PragerU are not only exploiting the practices of scriptural inference, but are also relying on search engine optimization and suggested content to elevate their messaging. Still, the concern here isn't just that people are going to click on their YouTube videos and watch some misinformation. Instead, it seems like PragerU is trying to actually make something out of the U in their name and become an educational program, at least for the kiddos. Aside from their courses, study guides, and quizzes, they have a parent action guide too, which is especially concerning for me. In the first section, they literally instruct parents on how to legally opt your student out of things like sex ed or health instruction in conflict with religious beliefs. And they even offer surveys surrounding a student or parent's beliefs around sex, family life, morality, and religion. If a parent wants to teach their student sex ed, that's fine. However, the people that PragerU is advertising to are the same people that don't want sex ed in schools at all. And considering that I don't see PragerU kids offering an alternative to these programs, no educational, reliable, accurate information, it's a pretty worrying stance to take. No sex ed doesn't mean no teens are going to have sex, but it definitely means a reduction in safe sex. If PragerU kids actually had kids' best interests at heart, you'd think that they'd know this. Instead, they're prioritizing their values, their religion, and their personal beliefs over actual education and tools that may help an actual kid. It doesn't seem to end at sex ed either, as section two is entitled Escalation Steps and all about telling parents how to gather talking points, recruit other parents, talk to school leaders, and potentially end other educational courses that they don't agree with. They also have a template letter or script that parents can use in their final section too. All in all, they seriously believe they're helping people. Whether that's by keeping kids out of sex ed or saving kids' minds from the leftists, PragerU kids completely ignores the potential harm and misinformation they spread. Even if PragerU themselves are not yet welcome in the classroom, I'm a bit concerned that homeschool parents looking for resources might come upon their prep program and see it as nothing more than some extra credit. Though of course, PragerU, for all their experience in education, has reposted clips from Fox News that accuse critical race theory and gender theory lessons as propaganda. So, I mean, if you hopefully have more than like five brain cells clicking together, you should figure out that something's not right here. And again, I know that I may sound like a bit of a pearl clutcher with all of this think of the children talk, but I personally feel that PragerU kids have crossed a line from patriotism into propaganda and it is dangerous and it's a real serious issue. But again, with all of that being said, those are just my thoughts, opinions, and feelings on today's topic, which is again, PragerU Kids. If you learned something new in today's episode, make sure that you are liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you enjoyed this, you may enjoy some of my other content. Make sure to check my Linktree link in the description box. You're gonna find links to my Twitch, to my second channel where we upload clips and shorter kind of cut up versions of those streams, all of my social media, and a variety of other projects that I may be involved in. I know that sounds kind of sus that I may be involved in. I'm trying to like future proof it a little bit. So if you saw this video like a year from now, you'd be like, aha, here's a new project that she didn't mention then. So anyway, with that being said, that is the end of today's episode. Hope you learned something new and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.